Okay, I think we are ready. So, you are on the floor, it is yours. Thank you very much. Let me start with a quick introduction. My collaboration with the professor started in the same year as Wigner got the Wigner Medal when I was born to him. And our collaboration initially involved programming together on this very cute precursor of the modern personal computer. I wrote my first program on this computer. This was the program. I was very proud of it. And it ignited my lifelong passion for computer science. And I'm sure I'm not the only one in this room whom the professor inspired in their career. Later in the early 2000s, we gave it, oops, what happened? It wasn't me. Okay, there it is. We gave a talk together, we taught a course called Modeling Reality. Uh, my father was the main lecturer and I was the teacher's assistant. It was aimed at a broad audience of sociologists, biologists, anybody who needed to model, build models of the surrounding world. And this later turned into a book, which we first published in Polish, then we published an updated version in English, and then Professor Zofia Dernicka Mirula translated the updated version to Polish, so it was a real family business. I recently took a look inside the book to see how well it stood the test of time, or if we need to make another foreign version. Well, I have to say most of the concepts here are pretty timeless, except two, which immediately jumped out, neural networks and artificial intelligence. Because if you open any newspaper today, you would think that really a lot has changed in these areas in the last few years. Chat GPT made a huge splash when it went public half a year ago, made the cover of Time magazine. Covers of magazines themselves are being generated by these AI models. And some people even say that these AI systems are so powerful that they will end all of humanity. <laughs> but the interesting thing is that these neural networks, because these AI systems are all neural networks now, they are not fundamentally different from the neural networks which we described in our book. So what I want to talk about today is how these new neural networks are very similar to the ones from 20 years ago and 20 years before that, how they're different, and talk about the two developments in machine learning which turned these fairly obscure neural networks that nobody was using into these ubiquitous, very, very powerful tools which we can use to write emails, generate art, or solve even complex math problems. And to start, I was going to show you a demo of one of the programs we included with our book that showed how these neural networks worked at the time we were writing it. Unfortunately, AV bots did not allow this, but I have a pre-recorded video because I was expecting something like that to happen. But I invite you all to go and download um, the programs. They still work uh, miraculously on Windows, so you can play around with it yourself. Um, this is a program which allows you to train a neural network to do optical, if not optical, but to recognize handwritten digits. And you start, of course, with providing it with a lot of examples. So in this case, I was drawing like one example zero, another example zero. I have to speed this up, it's taking a really long time to create all these labeled 30 examples, three for each digit. And then once that's done, you can choose what your neural network's gonna look like. And at the time, the only kinds of neural networks people were using were these fully connected um, multi-layer perceptrons, like you see here. So you didn't get a lot of choices. And then neural network gets trained, and once that's done, I'll speed up a bit again, you can use it to recognize digits. So you can see here, I'm drawing digits, and the neural network here on the left is predicting what that digit is. So how does this work? In a nutshell, 
nutshell, a neural network is a function. It's really nothing but a function, which changes an input vector into an output vector. In this case, the input vector encodes this squiggle somehow. It just turns it into a bunch of points sampled in different places, and we get a vector representation of this digit. Now, every neuron in the next layer of the network simply computes a linear combination of the values of the previous layer, all of the values. That's why it's called fully connected. And every other neuron does the same, but with different coefficients of this <coughs> linear combination. So essentially, each layer of the network takes the previous layer and multiplies it by a matrix of these weights, and then applies a nonlinear function. And every other layer does exactly the same with the previous layer. So it's like layer times matrix times layer times matrix, and at the end you get some kind of output. Initially, all these coefficients or weights or parameters, they're initialized at random. So initially such a network produces completely random output. Uh, so next, what we do is we train the network by comparing this output to the one that we want it to produce. In this particular case, we wanted to produce a one hop and go coding of the digit that I just drew. So since this is digit three, we want to have a one on position three and zero everywhere else. And then we compare this tool and the difference between what we want and what we got, that's the error. And nice thing is that this function is fully differentiable. So we can compute the derivative of this error with respect to each and every one of these weights. And we use that to, in each step, update each weight a little tiny bit proportionally to the value of this derivative with respect to that weight. And that's it. That's really all there is to it. You take a parameterizable differentiable function. In this case, it's mostly multiplication by matrices. Uh, you compute the error or loss function, and you use that to update the weights incrementally in a technique called gradient descent. And ChatGPT is exactly the same in this respect, in that there's also a neural network or function which is comprised mostly of matrix multiplication operations, and it's also trained using gradient descent to produce the correct answer. So how come ChatGPT can do so much more than this little network could? Well, if you ask many people, they will immediately say, we have much more compute power now than the data. And that's definitely a factor which played an important role. These blue dots here show how much you had to pay for a machine which had a gigaflops of power, so it could do one um, billion floating point operations per second. In the 80s, if you wanted to do that, you had to buy something like six supercomputers from Craig, and that would set you back in today's dollars, hundreds of millions of dollars. Very expensive. Then, of course, computers started being mass produced, both the computers you have at home as well as the data centers. They all use very similar hardware, specifically the piece of hardware that performs these floating point operations was the CPU, central processing unit. And that's optimized for making these individual operations at a time. So if you want to multiply two numbers, you load it into registers and say, CPU, go multiply them. And if you want to do it a thousand times, you do it a thousand times. Of course, CPUs did get uh, faster and faster, and we figured out how to put multiple cores into one CPU. So, by the way, note that this is a logarithmic scale, so this progress was exponential. And then another big step came with GPUs. So, initially, of course, GPUs, graphics processing units, were created for graphics, specifically for gaming, because people liked to play these games where you walk around a 3D environment, and we typically shoot at things. And when you do that, every time your character kind of moves a little bit to the left, 
you have to recompute all the pixels on the screen. But the way you compute them is you perform various matrix operations like multiplication. So GPUs were designed to be good at multiplying lots of numbers at a time. So entire matrices or vector times much matrix. <coughs> Which incidentally is exactly what we were doing with the neural network. So they're a perfect fit for executing neural networks. Then the next thing people often mention together with compute is data. And thanks to the internet, we have a lot of data available. For example, Common Crawl is a, a nonprofit which periodically crawls most of the web and makes it publicly available. And that constitutes the bulk of what these large language models are trained on. And you can see that in the last decade, um, the size of Common Crawl also went up. But that other scale on the right, in terabytes, that's not a logarithmic scale. That's been more or less linear growth. That's why a lot of people are now saying that we will soon uh, run out of data, which means that the bottleneck for training even larger language models is probably going to be data rather than compute, judging from where this is going. But that's not the only thing that happened. A key thing that I think made a difference and made ChatGPT possible is self-supervised learning. So the example with the digits, that was supervised learning. We had example scribbles, and it was labeled. What is the correct answer? The advantage of this, of course, is that it's very clear how to use this to train a neural network. But the disadvantage is you saw how like, long it took it to speed up the video to draw all these digits, and that was just 30. Thank you if you have to do millions and billions of these. So we're limited by amount of these training examples that you can manually produce. On the other hand, we have unsupervised learnings, where we have only examples, like sentences from the internet. And those are abundant, but without the labels, it's really unclear how to learn from it. So people try different ways of bridging this gap, and what really ended up working well is self-supervised learning. So a very simple concept, and it simply says that you can take unlabeled data and automatically translate it into labeled examples so that humans don't have to and you can do it at scale. So you're still using supervised learning, you're using still the same exact neural network training algorithm, but now you have really a lot of data to train on. And so one example of this, and this is how language models are built, is you take an unlabeled example, which is a sentence from the internet, and you blank out some work. So you say, okay, now the problem is you have a sentence with a blank, the quick brown blank jumps over the lazy dog, and the correct answer is false. So you basically train neural network to predict the missing word or the next word, something similar. So this really helped. But again, it's not the only thing that was important. And of course, big contribution is new neural network architectures. So remember when I said that when we were writing the book, everything was a multi-layer, fully connected perceptron. But over these years, people experimented and experimented with different ways of connecting these neurons. And some of these ways ended up working very well. The first one that really became very famous is the convolutional neural networks for image classification. Image classification is similar to the handwritten digit problem, but we wanted to work on an arbitrary bitmap. So the input is a bitmap of pixels. And the goal is to recognize many different classes, dogs, cats, even breeds of dogs. So you could use a fully connected network for that, but that would be very inefficient because you'd be learning what an eye looks like all over again if the eye is like in one position and or if it's in a different position in the image. So convolutional neural networks, they don't connect the first neuron to all the pixels, but they only connect them to one patch. And then we divide the whole image into these patches, and each gets its own neuron, but they all use the same weights. So if one such neuron learns what an eye looks like, it's going to work anywhere in the image. 
And then you can combine these, you can have multiple of these neurons, you can kind of add these components horizontally and vertically. And when you do that, the lower layers end up wearing lower level features, very similar to how our visual cortex works. The next big thing, in my view, that happened was word to vec which I think gave us already most of the pieces of that GPT already 10 years ago. And what it did, it was use the problem of uh, self-supervised learning to guess the missing word from any corpus of text. But a very, very important thing that word to vec had is it had vector representations of every word in the vocabulary. So just like the weights in a neural network, these vectors were initialized randomly, and they were trained just like the weights in the neural network to gradient the center. But what you got in the end was a lookup table, which gave you, for every word, a vector. And this is now called embeddings. It wasn't at the time, but now it's the most powerful tool in a machine learning engineer's toolbox. If you open your phone with face unlock, First thing it does computes an embedding of your face. If you then log into Facebook, Facebook downloads the embedding of your user to determine what to show you. So it turned out a very powerful tool. And one thing I don't think even the authors of this paper expected to happen was that it turned out that the network learned all sorts of things that it wasn't explicitly trained on. And you can see that just by doing simple math on these vectors. You could take the vector for king, subtract the vector for man, and add the vector for woman, and we got a vector which is very close to the vector for queen. And that worked with all sorts of things, capitals. So it learned not just to like predict the next word that's correct grammatically, but it learned about the structure of language and about the world, like about capitals and things. So this was already almost uh, tragedy, but not quite. These are individual words. We also did a lot of work while we, my fellow uh, machine learning engineers mostly, uh, to process entire sentences. And that was mostly driven by translation, which is a very popular problem to work on, translate automatically one language to the other. And that was achieved with, for a long time, with these recurrent neural networks, which basically took one word at a time of the input sentence, used it to update its state, then second word, third word, and so on, every time updating the state. And that was the encoder part of the network. And then once the sentence done, the decoder part of the network would kick in and start decoding that state, again, word by word, into the target language. And the nice thing is that you don't really need the encoder if you're not doing translate, because you can use just the decoder to produce coherent sentences or even better, start it off with some words that you provide, and it's going to continue with some kind of plausible continuation. So these, this is how all these generative AI models for language work. They just produce something that's plausible, that's the most probable given their training data. But recurrent neural networks don't scale well for a variety of reasons that we don't have time to go into, but they are slow to train, they have lots of issues, so we did use them to actually generate chatbots, but it was a pain. And then, in 2017, Transformers saved the day, and it is now the architecture that is used for everything. They turned out very powerful, also people didn't expect it when the paper was published. Nobody paid attention, but now everybody pays attention. So it's very similar to the recurrent neural network, it was also generated, designed for translate, so it has a encoder, encoder, and decoder. Oops. Yeah, I I should have tried that. So the right stack, that's the decoder. So for Jab Chat GPT, we only use the right part of it. And it's composed of these basic building blocks, which are really five matrix operations, primarily matrix multiplication, some other very simple matrix operations. But it turned out that this architecture scales very well. So you can combine these basic components in a variety of ways. And just adding more 
keeps making the network better. So it scales very well. And also very important, it doesn't process one word at a time. It processes the entire thing at once. So it's very fast to parallelize, very fast to run on GPU. And you can just keep adding more of these components, and it just gets better and better and better if you have a lot of data. So we're almost, almost half ChatGPT. One final step we need to do. You see, if you train a neural network model to predict to continue text, and it's trained on the entire internet, then when you ask it a question, it's not always going to answer the question. It's going to continue with what's plausible. So that could be, it could be thinking, oh, we're doing a dialogue, I'm going to answer, that's happy path. But more often than not, it's going to think, oh, we're listing questions now, so I'm going to list different questions. So you can't really converse with it. Um, machine learning engineers don't really care about this problem because we figured out how to prompt it. So now you may hear this title, prompt engineer. So prompt engineers know how to talk to a neural network like this. For example, if I wanted it to give me the type capital of Paris, I'd give it an example. It's one shot learning, Italy, Rome, and then France, and tell it to continue. And that usually works, but it's not very user friendly to generate these prompts. So what OpenAI did is that I added an additional step. So still, the majority of the training process is you take the entire web and you train a large transformer model to predict the next word. And that constitutes the majority of training. But then we do something called fine tuning, which means that we alter the weights just a little bit by training the network now on a different task. And the task is not only to continue the text, but to continue it in the way that we want. So specifically, OpenAI wants, if it's OpenAI, it's going to train it. So they would specify guidelines, which say, okay, if it's a question, you have to answer. If you say it has to output JSON, you're supposed to output JSON. If it's a question how to build a bomb, then you're actually not supposed to answer. You're supposed to say your language model, and you can't do that. Um, so you do all these guidelines, and OpenAI actually asks a whole bunch of people to check different answers from uh, the GPT and say which ones better conform to the guidelines. You don't have to do it that way. Anthropic, which produced a very similar model, they used the language model itself because, as I said, with clever prompting, it can answer questions. So the idea is that you just fine-tune it a bit using some training data which says what is a better answer. And what is a better answer, of course, depends on the people who set these guidelines. And that is pretty much it. It's as simple as that. We take the neural networks, just like the ones we described in our book. You can uh, read our book to see how they work. You throw a lot of compute at it and an internet-sized data set. You use self-supervised learning to teach the network to predict the next word. You use a neural network architecture that scales very well to these large data sets and can run efficiently on a GPU. And then you fine tune it just a bit to not just continue the text, but to continue it in the way that you want it to continue. And that's basically child GPT. We ended our modeling reality book with some deep philosophical questions, like what is consciousness? What would happen if machines could think like us? So these questions, they have been around for millennia. But now with the chat GPT working as well as it is, people are asking these questions with <coughs> renewed sense of urgency. So I hope with this short talk, I gave you a little bit more context on how these language models work and what were all the things that happened to turn these simple models into the very, very powerful tools that you see today. Thank you. Thank you. It's time for questions. Yes, please. 
Uh, what is the source of the ran randomness in the answers? Because if the question is simple, then of course the answer is always I identical. But if we request, let's say, a page about Napoleon or whatever, we will not get always the same, exactly the same answer, right? It's an excellent question. And it depends on a parameter called temperature. Uh, so you know how the neural network it outputs a confidence for every next word, it's actually token, but you can think it has a confidence for every next word. Now you could pick always the one with the maximum confidence. And then it would indeed always produce the same output. But we usually don't do that. We usually sample from this distribution. So if there are two next words with high confidence, we sometimes pick the one with lower confidence, but with just lower probability. And how you sample depends on this parameter temperature. If it's zero, then it's actually always deterministic. Otherwise, we sample. ChatGPT doesn't expose it, but if you use the API, you can set a temperature to zero and see that it will always produce the same thing. Next question. Great talk. In one of the transparencies, you had gradient methods. So it's a steepest descent method that leads you into the solution. Uh, can you say what what gradient method that was? Because I have noticed that Sobolev gradients are the most effective ones. There has been a lot of work on this subject. Because yeah, the idea is that you go down the steepest path, but the question is how fast you go. Yeah. And you're obviously not going rolling an actual ball, but you're kind of jumping. And if you jump too fast, you risk jumping over the optimal step. So there's been a whole, whole lot of work uh, to find these algorithms which adjust the step size. And sometimes they don't even go in the steepest direction. It's a very large body of work, uh, so I'm not super familiar with it. I think Adam Optimizer was state of the art. Last time I had to implement a neural network from scratch. I think there may be something better now, but it's a very good question. Yes. Could you <clears throat> could you comment on why uh, GPUs are um, more important than normal CPU units, uh, and what makes the gaming platform so much more powerful for use in the neural network game? Yeah, great question. So GPUs uh, are simply very good at performing multiple operations in parallel. So you can save a lot of energy if you know that the operation you're performing is going to be all the time the same. So CPUs, they're like, I don't know if you're going to do it with these next numbers, so you have to actually load the actual operation. It has to look up how to do the operation, which is expensive. Instead of GPUs kind of doing, it knows that it has to do the same thing with matrices, and specifically matrix multiplication. It's the biggest operation. So they're additionally optimized for that one specific thing. And if you optimize for one specific thing, of course, you can do it much better than something that's a general purpose. And last question. Yes, I have a question about uh, the, uh, how to say, the logical thinking of this, uh, of this, of this AI, because we know that uh, ChatGPT can create uh, nice stories, coherent answers, etc., etc. When it comes to very logical thinking, like I know, theorem proving or uh, how to say, concluding something from uh, assumptions, uh, then it seems there are quite some problems. So, is there some approach towards actually ingraining this logic in the thinking, or uh, what way, which are the popular ways to deal with this problem? There is a lot of work now going into integrating these language models with other systems. So for example, there are now plugins which allow the language model to use uh, Wolfram Alpha, uh, for example. So it can, it can use these systems to some degree or to execute code to do these mathematical operations. It cannot go beyond the data it is trained on. So if there's a logic course on the internet which says, in order to solve this logic problem, you will open Python or Mathematica and do it this way, then ChatGPT can now also recall that and do something similar. It's probably not going to invent anything that humans didn't already put on the internet or generalizations of that. It's not going to come up with a 
theory of relativity when there was none previously. So you, you have to give up, unfortunately. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Let us thank both these speakers for this session.